Good evening. Uh, I am recording this a little bit ahead of time because of our schedule this week. Of course, we are not having a uh, midweek service, midweek Bible study uh, at the church uh, because uh, I'm away on vacation with my family. Uh, but I did want to uh, still give an opportunity uh, to have a Bible study this evening. And so uh, we're recording this uh, a little bit uh, ahead of time. It's actually on uh, on uh, Tuesday afternoon, and uh, we'll be posting it tomorrow evening at the normal uh, time. So if anything about it seems uh, any out of kilter, that that would be the reason. Uh, welcome each one of you. Glad that you're joining this evening. As always, uh, look forward to sharing uh, the time that we have together around God's Word and uh, and the fellowship that we have together. And of course, it's a little different when we're not doing that, but still, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful to God that he has provided for us the means that it is, uh, it is so available uh, to share things like this in a way that it's accessible to almost anybody in the world. If they have a, a phone or a, a television of any kind, uh, just a very short period of time, uh, we would have dreamed about the opportunity of being able to broadcast in that kind of way. And, uh, and yet God has opened the door for that, and we're very grateful for that. And so we thank each one of you that gather uh, with us this evening uh, online. Uh, some of you uh, each week uh, gather with us online, both on Wednesday night and also our morning uh, services, Sunday school and worship service. And I, I want to say again, thanks to the ones that uh, this past Sunday uh, carried on uh, so admirably while we were away. Dane just preached a, a, a marvelous message there on prayer, the importance of prayer, and how we can see from uh, from studying uh, the life of Christ, how prayer was important to him. And uh, I, I tell you, it, it just really uh, reminds me if the Lord needed to spend that much time in prayer, how much time do I need to spend and how much time do we need to spend and what a difference uh, it would make in our lives. So often we consider prayer as just a sideline, and yet uh, the Bible teaches us, and Dane shared with us how vitally important that is and so appreciate that and in this coming sunday we'll uh we'll still be away uh and uh, brother rick uh, from our church there rick armstrong will be uh bringing the message appreciate that and everyone that works in any kind of way and then uh we'll be back uh in fact be back in town sometime sunday afternoon uh and and plan to be back next wednesday night uh our our regular uh midweek service and the other activities of course watch on sunday morning for the uh announcements relative uh, to that. We're excited that, uh, that things are getting started on our building now. If you drive by uh, the church there, you'll see where uh, some work's being done. It's uh, not all that obvious yet, but very quickly you're going to start seeing something happening. We're really excited about the opportunities that's going to give for us and uh, the way the Lord has opened the door so uh, graciously for that, of uh, providing uh, the means. And even though it took us a little bit of while to get started, uh, everything uh, working in place there and just how uh, he's going to uh, provide. We're so grateful uh, for your financial support. Look forward to, uh, uh, to, uh, to continuing this project. And we actually have a couple of other things uh, in line. So your willingness to uh, financially support uh, our church and the Lord's ministry there uh, is, is so valuable and, and so precious. So just want to say all those things. And then uh, just in, in the way of announcements, Sunday school worship at their regular times, uh, Sunday morning. Be sure and join with us uh, for that if you can. If it's not uh, humanly possible for you to be there, uh, of course, all those things are uh, online, uh, both on Facebook and on uh, YouTube, uh, and so uh, invite you to do that. Now, this evening, I want us to look at a passage of Scripture uh, that comes from the book of Romans uh, in the eighth chapter. I'm in the process in my personal Bible study right now, working my way through uh, the letters uh, of Paul, uh, and I'm, I'm into uh, Corinthians right now, but uh, when I was uh, came through this passage, uh, uh, in the 8th chapter is, uh, is a, a, a great passage. The book of Romans uh, is considered by most Christians and most Bible scholars uh, the greatest uh, single book that's ever been written. It, it is just amazing uh, in, in the, the way that it guides us to understand the significance of salvation, the marvelous uh, gift of Christ on the cross to purchase for us 
uh, salvation and and and, and just, just a real uh, a real uh, amazing masterpiece of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. Uh, and we're grateful uh, for that, certainly. Uh, but there's a verse, and this is a verse that we use uh, really pretty often, especially when something doesn't go exactly like we want it to go, uh, is uh, in chapter 8 and verse 28, where Paul says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Now, if you back up and you, you read the earlier part of this, uh, in this chapter, you see how Paul talks about uh, the experience of sufferings. In verse 18, he says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And, and he talks about how that, that even... Uh, even creation itself uh, uh, groans and, uh, and, and the experience that, uh, that we are in. But, uh, but he, 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 just, he tells us how that God is working in these things. But this verse, I want us to look at, at there's just a lot in this one verse that he shares with us. And, uh, and if you, you take it apart, uh, you, you start and it says, and we know. Well, you know, there's so many people that live their lives with doubt. They live their lives with wonder. What is, uh, what's going to happen today? What's going to happen uh, tomorrow? In fact, if you ask many, many people that are Christians and you say, if you were to die today, do you know that you would go to heaven? And most people would say, well, I hope that I would go to heaven. If you ask them what would happen when you die, I hope I'll go to heaven. Well, the Bible makes it clear to us that we can know that. And so he starts this uh, with, with a we know. Now, the we know here is not dealing specifically with uh, the eternal life. It's dealing with, with our daily life. But the we know uh, is a foundational idea from Scripture for Christian people. We ought never to live our lives wondering what tomorrow holds, wondering what uh, things will be. We, we can't understand and know the events of tomorrow, but we absolutely can be positive uh, that, that they are in God's hands. And so when he starts here, he says, we know. Uh, well, then he goes beyond that because he says, we know. And then he says, we know that all things work together for good. So he's not saying there are some events in our life that God's going to be involved in and things will work out fine. But sometimes you're just going to be on your own. That's not at all what he says. What he says here is as a Christian, the Holy Spirit dwelling within me and me striving in the living of my life to be as close to him as I can, it establishes a relationship that is permanent, but it also is a relationship that is complete. Uh, for I know that everything, that God is in everything. God's in the big things in life. You know, a lot of people uh, tend to have the idea that, uh, that the, the little things happen in my life, they're not important enough for God to deal with. You know, in almost any kind of organization, uh, there are people, in fact, if you remember in, in the Old Testament, even that Moses uh, finally received the advice that you can't do everything, you've got to have some other people and you delegate things. And and so any of us that are in any kind of position of, of leadership or responsibility, if whether it's a business or whether it's a church or, or what kind of organization it is, generally you'll have a person that that you would say is the, the CEO or the person at the top of the organization, and they deal with the most significant things, but the smaller day-to-day -day things, you don't, they, they don't really deal with. I mean, right now, we're, of course, we're in the middle of an election year. Uh, this fall, we're going to elect a president. Well, the president has ultimate authority and responsibility for everything that happens in our country but he certainly cannot deal with everything that happens. And so there are literally thousands of people that work with him. But there's a, a large group of people that are his very closest advisors that take care of things on a day-to-day -day basis. And many times he may not even be aware of those things. But in, in his name, through his authority, they work. Well, that's the way the world works. And, and it's that way with the president, it's that way with a business, it's that way uh, with a, a church, it's that way in almost any kind of organization, but it is not that way with God. Uh, it's not that way at all with God. There are not any things in the relationship between me and God that he has delegated to somebody else. You know, some people believe 
that if you if you come to the Lord, you have to come through somebody. So, some uh, churches teach that you you have to go through the priest to get to God. That there's not that direct access. But we know that uh, when when Jesus died on the cross, He opened that access, and what had been present, what was called the veil in the temple, which actually was not what we think about a veil. It actually was a very heavy tapestry that was a wall between the people and the Holy of Holies, which was where they believed the very presence of God was, and there was a separation of that. And nobody uh, could access that other than the high priest, and that only once a year, and that only under the very strictest of circumstances. But that veil was rent from top to bottom, and suddenly that access was opened, and now you and I have direct access to God, so the the most what would the world would say are insignificant things in our life, we can take it directly to God. We don't take it to somebody else. We don't take it to a person and say, uh, "I want you to carry this on up to the boss." You're talking to the boss. So when you pray, you are praying to God Almighty, the the, the God of this universe, the Creator of this universe, the powerful God. He is He is all knowing. He is all powerful. He is all caring. And so when I say that we know that all things are working. All things are working because God is the one in charge and God is the one acting. I'm not asking somebody else to do something on his behalf. He is at work. So we know that all things, and what do we say next? That all things work together for good. They work together for good. So when I understand that my life, if I will allow it to be, is in the hands of God. Uh, through Christ, I trust him as, as my Savior, He and he gives me access to God, and that access means that God is, is intimately involved in my life. Now, a lot of people disagree with me about this, but if those of you that have listened to me through the years, you know that I am convinced that God has a specific plan for every person's life. Uh, when you were born, little baby was placed in the hands of your mother and dad there. God already had a plan laid out for your whole life. Now, the sad thing is that most of us never really find ourselves completely in that plan. And we will in many ways find ourselves short of that plan. We come short of the things. He will. So therefore, we miss out on some of the very best things uh, in life for us. But if we will allow him to, if we'll strive for it, the plan God has laid out for us is far better than the plan we would lay for ourselves. And so when we say all things are working for good, they are working for good in the qualification of what God says is good. I read somewhere the other day, and I, I, I don't remember exactly the way it was, but basically it, it said when something in your life doesn't work out the way that you want it to, if you're trusting the Lord you can believe that he will work it out better than the plan you have, and when it's finished, it will be exactly what you would have wanted. I, I've sometimes put it this way. If you'll pray and ask the Lord for something, he will give you exactly what you would have asked for if you only knew that's what you wanted. You see, I don't even know in my own life what's best, but I do know that he knows what's best, and I trust him, and there's been a number of times in my life that if I had done what I wanted to do and things had worked out, uh, it would have been a mess. I could spend an hour right now or more telling you just some of the miracles that had taken place uh, in uh, mine and Linda's life together since we've been married as God has guided and directed some things that have worked out uh, far beyond anything we could have ever imagined. And if the thing we tried to do would have worked, we would have been in a mess. And, and so he works for good. And, and very often it'll be things that we say at the moment, man, I, I don't like that. I wish that hadn't happened, but he's working and his plan is at work. And if I make a determination that I will trust him, I will trust that plan in my life. I will be absolutely convinced at the end, this is the very best that could ever be. I, I'll tell you, I've never had a time that I've had somebody talk to me and say, you know, I was in a situation and I just completely trusted the Lord with it. 
I did what his word said. I tried to read and understand what it said. I followed the truth of the word. I tried in every way I could to live for him. And when I got to the end, I sure was disappointed. Uh, you won't hear people say that. If they're honest with you, they will tell you when I got to the end, this verse was true in my life. I know, I know God is at work in everything and he's working in everything for good. So then you come to the point that somebody says, well, that's just marvelous because that means that everybody in the world has access to God, to the goodness of God, to the grace of God, to the mercy of God, to the miracles of life at, uh, of God at work in their life. But that's not true because if you keep reading this verse, he says there's a qualifier to this. He says we know all things work together for good who to those who love God, to those who love God and who are the called according to his purpose. So if you, don't, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, uh, you cannot expect that God's at work in your life in the same way he is in the life of a person that is trusting Christ and living for him. Now, the blessings of God in many ways may still be in your life. You know, the Bible tells us that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. That is, every morning that you wake up, if you breathe the breath of life, you're being blessed by God right there. His, his blessing is in your life. And so you have that, and, and that's going to be yours no matter what. But, but the time will come that that will end, and the blessings of God will cease to be a part of your life if you don't know him. But if you do know him, during that intervening period of time, you have the miracle of God at work in your life. And I'm, I'm telling you, I can tell you from personal experience, and I can tell you from personal observation in the lives of other people, the miracles of God are present in the lives of of those who trust him and seek to follow him. And I do believe, I absolutely do believe that God blesses those who trust him in ways beyond what he does to those who fail to trust him, fail to obey him, fail to follow him. Uh, a lot of times I, I say this and I have to be really careful how I say it because things in my life that take place, I'm not better than anybody else. Uh, there's, there's not anything about me that's better than anybody else. But I will tell you this, I live better than some people do. And that's not I live better in a, high, in a higher quality. I, I live better because I trust the Lord. Uh, I'm walking with the Lord every day. And if you are not, you are living at a level below where you ought to be. And you are living at a level uh, that ultimately will not bring you uh, joy, but it will bring you heartbreak. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death or destruction, depending on the translation that you look at. And so this is a promise that applies only to those who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose, who are living for him. And notice how you go, if you continue to the next verse, the, the completion of this promise, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, what is he saying there? What he's saying is that the goal that God has for your life is not for you to be wealthy. It's not for you to be famous. It's not for you even to be happy. It's for you to be like Christ. But the desire that God has for the life of every Christian person is to be as near like Christ as it is possible. And so I am to be conformed to the image of the Son of God, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So when I make a, a I have a question in my life, and I, I'm telling you, we live in a world right now where people are making a lot of really bad choices on a regular basis. And sometimes, uh, I mean, I watch things happening in people's lives and I know that they're on the way to a wreck. I mean, this is not going to turn out well and you know it from the beginning. And if they would stop and think they would, and you see the end of it there and it's because they're following uh, the desires of the world. They're following the things that the world says uh, and, and they are, they are conforming to this world and the things of this world. But the call of God is for us to be conformed to him. So every, every choice I make uh, should be based on what exactly do I believe God would have me to do in this situation and what can I do that will cause me 
to be as near like Jesus as it's possible to be. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I, I make a lot of, uh, of mistakes. I do a lot of things that I, are, are different than what I should do. I try not to do things that are wrong, but I will tell you, and and Linda will uh, will testify to this, that any time that I'm confronted with something, I tell her I'm going to try to do what's right. If the person that I'm dealing with does what's wrong, that's between them and the Lord. I'm going to try to do what's right. Uh, and, and you say, well, how do you know what's right? I open God's word and I read it and I study it and I believe it. And I'm telling you, I, I've, got, I've got no patience uh, or place in my life, certainly, uh, for, for the idea that, you know, God's word is there, but we read it and then we decide what parts of it we like and what parts we're going to follow. And if something doesn't fit into my plan, I can change it. I, I got no place for that. I'm going to try the best I can to read what God's word says, to understand it and to live it. And when I do that, that is in my life seeking to be conformed to him. So the, it's good to those who are called according to his purpose and who are in the process of being conformed to the image of his son. And that's his goal for us. And the thing about it is, you know, the Lord's, Lord's blessed me uh, and, and Linda and, and our family, I mean, beyond imagination. I, I had a conversation with a really good friend of mine a couple of weeks ago, and we were sitting there both of us saying, you know, we're, we're about to, very close to the same age, good friends for years. And, and I told him, I said, you know, if, if I go back to, to when I, Linda and I first got married and we were starting, you know, most people said they won't, they won't make it at all. They, we didn't stand a chance. Uh, and on our own, we probably wouldn't have. But I say, I would have never dreamed that God would have blessed me the way that he has. But everything that I have in this world, everything that he's placed into our hands is temporary. It's very temporary. And, and in the scheme of things, you know, as, as we get older, uh, most of you know, I mean, this year I turned 70 years old. And, uh, and I can remember when I said, man, if I was 70, I'd be lucky if I could get out of bed in the morning. But the Lord blesses me still to have good health and strength. I'm able to go uh, and do, and I'm very grateful for that. But if he gives me 70 more years, which is very, very unlikely, that still is only a wink compared to eternity. And so I'm not so concerned about what's going on in this life. I mean, it's, it's marvelous. I enjoy living. I enjoy life. I enjoy being around folks, people that know me. No, I love to have a good time. I, I love a laugh. I love all those things, but I love the Lord. And I want in my life to, to know that I'm living a life that is climbing, trying to be more conformed to the image of his son, that I may be able to be that person. That when I finally step across from this life to the next, that I can hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Uh, I, the, I long that more than anything. I don't know exactly what that's like. We read the Bible and it gives us all kinds of things. Uh, but I've seen, there's a painting that's out. Many of you have probably seen it as a picture. Uh, uh, looks like a young lady maybe uh, that's just stepped into heaven and she has run up to Jesus and she's got her arms uh, thrown around his neck and he's hugging her and she is hugging him. And I don't know what it's like, but, but to know that your life has been lived in such a way that you are welcomed. I know with, uh, through the years, there's been times that family members are away for a period of time uh, under all different kinds of circumstances, some for longer and more difficult than others. But when somebody comes home, uh, man, you can't wait to see them get out of get out of the car or whatever. And many times they'll come out and they'll come running to somebody with a big hug because they're so glad to see them. We see a lot of times the images of somebody that's returning home after being uh, deployed in the military. And of course, that's the situation you don't know if you'll ever see them again. Uh, and sometimes after a long period of time, here they come home and you see uh, those children or that uh, that wife or husband coming up there, uh, brother, sister, whatever it is, and that, that embrace of joy, finally home, finally home. And so for us to live our life in such a way that we understand, that we know that everything, all things are working, and they're working for good in God's eyes, according to his plan, according to his purpose, for us because we are 
the children of God. We are those who follow him. If you're not that, if you if you have to say honestly, uh, Brother Tim, I, I have to say that what you're talking about sounds great, but I don't have that kind of relationship with God. Well, the Bible tells us that every single one of us is born into sin. And when we reach the age of accountability, that sin becomes our responsibility. And the Bible tells us in this same book in Romans that Paul wrote that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Paul was describing how they didn't make any difference whether you were under the law and understand it or did not know it, Jew or Gentile, either one, everybody sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then he says the wages of sin, the, the, the answer for sin, the consequences of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And the reason for that is because God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then Paul says that if we will believe in our heart, that Jesus is Lord and confess, believe that he was raised from the dead and confess that he is Lord. It's something you believe in your heart, in your mind. It's something you confess with your mouth. It becomes a reality. If we do that, we will be saved. And on the authority of God's word, I can tell you right now, you pray that simple prayer. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I realize that I have come short of who I ought to be. And I understand that according to the Bible, because of that, the consequences of that is my eternity to be spent separated from you. But I want to know you. I want to follow you. I believe Christ died on the cross to pay for my sins. I invite you to come into my heart now. I confess my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. And I ask you to forgive me. Come into my heart. Live. Give me guidance. Help me to live for you each day. You pray that prayer. You mean it. Your life will never be the same. I appreciate you joining us this evening uh, and look forward to time when we'll be able to gather maybe next week, uh, 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 Lord willing, uh, in person. Invite you to have the rest of a good week. We thank you so much for what you do. We love each one of you. God bless you and good night.